different corners of the world that have decided to make Newfoundland and Labrador their home or have done so for generations. They recently published an anthology with Breakwater Books, and I'll link to this later in the chat so you can get a copy for yourself, uh, entitled Us Now. And in this collection, the collective's authors explore themes like queer love, identity, safety, family, and belonging, just to mention a few. This panel today will specifically examine the work and the way living on an island influences their lives and experiences. So we have four panelists with us today, including our hosts, Santiago Guzman, we're going to let them introduce themselves to you in their own way. We are recording this event and it is streaming live on YouTube, as I mentioned. You will be able to watch and share this recording later today. If you have a question for any of the panelists, we ask that you send in your questions to the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And you can also use the chat function to share any thoughts, comments, or questions. And to those on YouTube, you can leave us a comment uh, or take part in the conversation happening here. And I'll relay your questions to Santiago later on. And now our panelists. Hi, my name is Xavier Campbell. <clears throat> I studied the book of Genesis for three weeks in preparation for our first practice, but all that went out the window the moment I walked into the room and saw him for the first time. This high color, yellow skinned, lanky boy with a big curly afro. He was the only other boy in the room. I couldn't take my eyes off him. The jitters once associated with reciting Bible verses from memory had been replaced by thoughts of how I was getting to get this boy to play doctor with me. His name was Kareem. His dad was pastor, which basically made him royalty, a prince. We were new to this church, but after two weeks, mommy volunteered to be the church secretary, which also gave me some standing in the hierarchy. It at least meant both Kareem's family and mine would get free lunch and would have seats reserved in the dining room. Over time, we bonded, mostly because we only had each other. There were other young boys at church, but none of them were stuck there with their parents like we were. Proximity and circumstance would see to it that our bond would flourish, and my desire to play doctor with this boy would hopefully come to fruition. Puberty may have been late, but my affections for Kareem had started growing on time. Hi there, I'm Sue Hashu. Have I been a good father? The question was unintentional. You took a longer, harder draw to mask the nervousness that stab at your throat. The cigarette your only vice, burned faintly in the light of dusk, the rising smoke twisting as it danced towards the sky. Her eyebrows, a feminine mirror of your own, arched in surprise. You were not around very much. You were a 7-Eleven man, not the convenience store kind, but one who left the house by seven in the morning and if it were a good day, home by 11 in the night. Worthwhile hours spent on money making, not so much time left for your wife and children. You do not remember much of what they were like when they were small. Hesitant to hold them while they were soft and defenseless, convinced that your hands, strong from years of athleticism, would irreparably damage them in play. So you chose a safe distance, like most men of your generation, knowing your children through your wife's eyes, ears, and lips. Thankfully, the kids were happy enough to see you and family outings, few and far between, were always pleasant. Despite your initial fears, they grew up strong on a tropical island. Scraped knees and broken bones, thriving under the haze of the sun and the hum of the cicada songs. Stroked their hair in silent goodnights. The residual heat on their sun-kissed heads long after they had fallen asleep and only when you thought your wife didn't know. Sometimes you would come home in the darkest of night to find your desk leg on, a little flower resting underneath. You never knew its name, but you had seen your children wear it in their hair. The heat from the lamp drew the flower's delicate fragrance, a timid scent in the air, and you would smile as you lit a cigarette, your wife coming any moment with a bowl of soup to ask about your day. The decision to move the family to a new continent was not fast or easy. You made several prospective journeys after much discussion with your wife the children blissfully unaware. They found out in the winter before your move and they were excited enough, 
their knowledge of the future new home started and ended with the many famous misadventures of that red hair island girl. You thought it was serendipitous that the children should connect with that story out of all the books in your family collection and offer silent thanks to your ancestors for luck, taking it as a sign and blessing, though you have never been one for superstitions. You arrived in the middle of the summer, late in the night, after a 30 hour journey. The children were ecstatic to see the internationally recognizable golden arch of a global fast food franchise, but there the similarities ended. Apprehension set in. But they're children, you and your wife told yourselves. They are adaptable by nature. And there's nothing to worry about. Besides, look at them. They were delighted. They were stiff trying to introduce themselves in an unfamiliar tongue when they met their teachers and they made a face of spaghetti, but this was expected. They will adjust. Look how excited they were throwing rocks on the beach. Only a little disappointed that they could not swim in the frigid water. Or how happy they were to plant a bulb in your sister's backyard, though they dug mere inches before their hands started to bleed from the rocks that made up this island. Everything will be fine. They will adjust. You all have to. The theory held until your wife called you in tears a few months in. Your cheerful son was pushed by another child on the school bus, and your willful daughter has thrown a dictionary to the wall, and they both cried and screamed to go home, frustrated by the language barrier that they try so hard to crack and make you no know, breakthroughs. They fought viciously, and your tomboy left the dinner table with her little brother in tow, slamming the bedroom door shut for the very first time in her life, locking their mother out. She had not always been an easy or obedient child, but she was rarely rude. This was a sign that something was changing faster than you anticipated and in a direction you did not like. Hello, my name is uh, Zainova and I'm going to read uh, What Are Buffalo Boys? Day by day, Adha grew up into a large male buffalo. As is common in the animal kingdom, he was ready to be mated with Kirat. We had high hopes for Adha, but Adha did not seem interested in mating. Achang, when will Adha mate Kirat? Don't ask me. Achang was my nickname. I don't know. I want to see his penis get hard, I said. We waited for days and months, but Adha did not seem to like mating with our female buffalo. We were feeling discouraged with Adha. Finally, my father once again asked for EP to rent Suhardi's male buffalo. Suhardi had about 10 buffaloes. His house was surrounded by wide coconut farms and lakes. E.P. brought Suhardi's male buffalo to the back of our house where Kirat and Adha were. E.P. left them together and let Suhardi's male buffalo do his thing. We had been waiting for the magic to happen when suddenly Adha tried to ride that male buffalo. He was about to mate him. Apparently, Adha felt aroused by the male buffalo. Don and I laughed out loud. We did not know what that was all about. <laughs> Look at that, brother. Adha wants to mate the male buffalo, Don said, pointing at the two male buffaloes. Then there was a fierce battle between the two male buffaloes. Horns collided with horns and Adha lost the fight. Thank you. I crossed looks with the woman in the mirror and could not keep my eyes off of hers. They reminded me of my mama, Juana. She would have never worn this much makeup, yet the darkness of my pupils, the downturned shape of my eyes, my soft angled browns reminded me of mama. 
I followed down the bridge of my nose with my index finger, reassuring the straightness of its structure. Anyone would have thought that the most talented sculptor had carved it. It seemed too good to be true. And my lips were as soft as plums and colored with the most exquisite prickly pear red. I realized then I had gotten lucky with Mama's beauty. We both had the appearance of a blossoming dahlia, seemingly bright and harsh for the eyes, yet gentle and soft when touched. Gracias, Juana. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this panel. Um, my name is Santiago Guzman. My pronouns are he and him. And I am one of the 11 writers in this anthology called Us Now. And today we have um, Zay Nova, Zuha Shu, and Saver Campbell, um, four of, uh, well, four of us uh, being members of the Quilted Collective um, who uh, wrote stories for this beautiful an anthology published by Breakwater Books. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today. And we decided to uh, introduce ourselves through our writing, specifically our stories from the anthology, because I think that they resonate with who we are and where we are in time. Uh, so thank you all for coming. As Mandy mentioned, like feel free to uh, add questions uh, to the chat box, or if you're on YouTube um, joining us, please add those questions there and then they will come uh, to us later on. Um, I do have a couple of questions for the panelists. And um, I think that what we want to discuss is um, our relationship to where we are in time and space, um, specifically being uh, immigrants coming to the island of Uktahamguk, or colonially known as uh, Newfoundland. Um, so I guess that the first question um, that I have for the for the panelists is what does the word home means to you in the context of your writing? And what are the connections between your home countries um, and Newfoundland and Labrador? I should point out that uh, the three panelists uh, today are uh, Zay is from Indonesia, Zhu Hao is from Taiwan, and Saver is originally from Jamaica. Uh, both of uh, these uh, three uh, places being islands. Um, so it is very, very fascinating to find ourselves in this island as well. So in relationship with home and, and that concept with our home countries, how does that inspi um, inspire your work as writers? And I'm gonna start with uh, Zuha. Thank you, Santiago. So the word home, like home can be a brick and mortar accommodation, the simple roof of your head, or in most definitions, a place of safety and sense of belonging. So in my story, Across Oceans, uh, the narrative unfolds through the eyes of an immigrant father as he reflects on the path his family has taken over the years. And there are two easily found homes, so where they came from and where they landed, grown up and found themselves, which in the story is basically Newfoundland. Um, both of these places have uh, shaped the growth and change of members in the family, and each of them identify with differing levels of influence and which home is closer to their heart. But there's also a third home that couldn't be found on a map, and I deliver this in the form of um, intimate, difficult conversations that the characters have over the years in good and challenging circumstances, so that you see even when they're apart, the bonds keep them anchored to each other, and they are each other's place of belonging. Thank you so much for, for that, Suha. Um, yeah, it is it is um, really uh, like the work that you have done has been very beautiful in terms of like putting those worlds and, and the transition from one place to the other, uh, which works really, really beautifully in your piece. Um, Zay, uh, what, what do you think about the concept of home and the intersections between your home country and the place that we find ourselves in? Home uh, to me is uh, where the heart is, and my heart uh, is here in Newfoundland because I come from Indonesia in Bangka Island. So I can uh, I come from archipelago and I live in the small island called Bangka Island, surrounded by uh, sea. So when I uh, I 
discover not discover i uh, i came uh, migrated to uh, to canada the first time and uh, stopped in the, uh, toronto and vancouver and i found a connection to, to newfoundland the first connections to this land is people feeling home is feeling embraced feeling loved feeling respected and that's uh, the uh, the first feeling being among people and uh, being loved that that's a uh, home to me as that's like uh, when we come home we come home there is mother and father and brothers and sisters but if you are not embraced you don't feel home even though you were born in that house so home to me is where people uh, people are together to embrace you to be who you are and that is the first thing to make me feel I want to do more because when you feel love you get love you share love and you will want to do more thank you Zay yeah and there is something so beautiful about that uh, sense of safety where you can be yourself right and, and expand um, and I think that that can be translated wherever you are once you find and build those relationships around you. So yeah, thank you very much for saying that, Zay. And uh, what about you, Xavier? What are your thoughts on, on this question? I think I have to, <clears throat> I definitely will be piggybacking on Zay because it's, uh, to me, it's like where you feel comfortable in creating those relationships, those like lasting relationships. So like those early defining relationships that you feel okay to explore a part of you that you wouldn't have had the chance to otherwise. Well. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for that, Saver. I, I, I agree. Um, in terms of being the four of us immigrants uh, to this province, to this country, um, and specifically um, talking about immigrating to an island, how is that sense of identity different from what it could have been somewhere else? Like how being in an island has shaped our identity as immigrants. Um, and if that has been uh, transpired to your work, in what capacity? Um, so Saver, would you like to, to go first? Definitely. Um, well, I, I, I only write about Newfoundland and Jamaica, which are two islands, the only two places that I've lived. So I do think that, yes, if I had ended up somewhere else, then my work and my, I guess, my approach to life may have changed a little bit to, I guess, like adjust to a new culture and a new way of life. Because that island mentality, it does, it does transition a little bit. <clears throat> a lot of people were like, oh, how did you manage to like go from Jamaica to Newfoundland? But in a sense, I guess because they were both islands, there are some like things that weren't so shocking, you know, like I guess certain like access to certain things weren't so alarming to me, you know? So I guess um, some transitions were easier. And when I started writing and then I started realizing those similarities, it was good to put that into my work as well. Um, can I just ask back, uh, you have talked about those easy transitions. Would you like to talk about the not so easy transitions? Well, obviously, I guess, but being from Jamaica and um, growing up with one season and I, well, like, I guess romanticizing all the seasons on TV and then moving to Newfoundland and then moving to not having all four seasons. So <laughs> that, and then like, you know, there are other like uh, food things that aren't um, here, like mangoes, but um, a ripe fresh mango. But yeah, but yeah, those are the harder things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we would be very hypocritical if we avoid the thing about the weather, <laughs> uh, which I think applies to every, like, I, I mean, uh, anyway. I have strong feelings about the snow, but we're not going to go there today. We're not going to go there today. Uh, Zuhao, uh, again, how how does that being now in our current context in, in Newfoundland, being in, in an island, how is that 
identity for you as an immigrant being here? So, you know, for the island aspect of me, I was born on an island and I visited many islands. Now I've settled and continue to live on an island. So there's that really wonderful sense of continuity to my connection to identity as an islander. And I, I think it, in writing, it encourages me to um, examine, especially the connection between people like Xavier and um, as I have already said, like when you're in a insular type of location, like what anchors you is less of the location, more of the people and that sense of community that you are able to transition into. So, and especially when it comes to family and community. And I'm, I'm also very fond of highlighting nature and how we play within and with it and the relationship I think we should cultivate with land, sea and sky, especially in an island setting where you know, wherever you see, you see elements of these three not far from your coast. It is a, it's a day-to-day -day, um, part of the lives of adapting to be an islander and being here, being a Newfoundlander. So that all kind of plays into like who I am and how it affects my work as writer. Totally, that adaptation to our surroundings and our context that I think, I mean, even though we, we all of us uh, on this call have been in Newfoundland for several years now, and that I think that that question about identity keeps changing and evolving. Um, and as writers, I think it's, it's fabulous to see that growth and that evolution where questions around home and belonging and family starts changing with the years. So that is, that is a really good point, so how. Um, Zay, do you have any any thoughts on on being an immigrant in in this island in particular? For for you also coming from uh, an island like Indonesia. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> when the uh, I I come here uh, 2017, many people start to ask, "Where are you from? Tell us more about your your culture, the music." and uh, so, uh, foods as well. So it's like uh, something, something. oh my God, before I, I didn't uh, learn how to cook, but suddenly I have to learn how to cook Indonesian stuff. That's that, uh, because I want to introduce to Newfoundlanders, right? <laughs> this is Indonesian things. <laughs> as well as uh, when I was performing music downtown, people want to hear how Indonesian's uh, traditional, Indonesian traditional music uh, sounds. Uh, so I sang them, uh, uh, Indonesian, Indonesian traditional music. So this land, um, like uh, I thought, I have to in, introduce, uh, I mean, to like uh, I have to show like what people are doing here, but no, people want to see your identity as an immigrant from Indonesia, because that is you, uh, who you are. You come from this, this, this uh, country with identity and cultures, and you have to share, make this culture richer. So to me, ah, this is beautiful. So it's 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 make me like when we start to write this 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 story as well here. I start to reflect what happened in uh, when I was a child. So I remember a really beautiful memories with my younger brother and our water buffaloes. So this this land uh, make me uh, what's that? Make me want to remember a piece of memories. I have since I was, uh, you know, uh, um, moved from uh, Bangka Island to Madura Island uh, to pray the love away for three years and uh, uh, mocked on the street and all kind of things that might make me think what happened in my life before. So it's like, is, is uh, this land, uh, what does that make me feel something that I have to tell, I have to tell uh, from uh, my, my previous uh, uh, country. So, yeah. Totally. No, that is so, so interesting. That point that you raise as a being immigrants and, and, you know, arriving here and being, being seen as such um, that we have to, you know, to talk about our home country, countries, to talk about our cultures. And sometimes, and, and something very similar happened to me that when I came here, I really had to to learn and understand my my culture a little bit better in order for me to answer the questions that people had around me right 
So when I was in Mexico, by the way, I am from Mexico, originally from Mexico. Um, when I was there, you know, I was immersed in my culture, immersed in my language, immersed in all of these beautiful things, but I didn't get to appreciate them until I left. Right. And then like there was this thing when I growing up, well, no, here that because being in an island, especially Newfoundland, so far away from or at the time uh, six years ago, where we're um, accessing uh, different ingredients, for instance, for my food, as uh, Saver sort of was mentioning before, um, I said to myself, you know what, I, I will make tortillas, handmade tortillas. Uh, and I had never done it in my life. And I was just said, oh, I'm Mexican. I know how to do it. And here you see me, you know, trying to make tortillas. Um, spoiler alert, I failed um, drastically. The, those were the worst tortillas I had ever seen in my life. Uh, but, but it's because of that, right? Because I was like trying to, to honor my culture and to eat the thing that made me feel closer to, um, to my home country. And, and I think it's, there is something really, really fascinating about like, you know, like everything that we have been talked uh, so far about our relationship to the land, our relationship to others and how we are um, and our definition of home. And I think that there are two very important things that I do want to acknowledge is the fact that as immigrants, we're coming into a country that has also a vast history and understanding, right, that um, the, the history about the First Nation, the first peoples that uh, were here before anyone else. And I think that to me, at least, is very important to also make space for my education to keep understanding that this is I am an immigrant and I am in shared land and perhaps not in a, I did not receive an invitation. Right. So I think it is my duty to be aware of that and to keep educating and learning about how uh, we can celebrate and honor those that have been here before me um, and that are still here with us. So there is that component about identity, but also once we decide to settle and, and call this place home, we encounter this thing about not being locals enough which I think it's fascinating because in a very similar way to uh, some of you folks and, and the writers from uh, us now, in my arts practice, I really try to honor my story as a Newfoundlander by choice and to say, this is my home. This is also my home and I have something to say that is perhaps not what we're used to in terms of, of that you know, narrow perception of what, uh, Newfoundland and Labrador actually is when it comes to diversity. So I wonder if anyone has any comments about that, about like um, this making space for these conversations, especially for us who have decided to make this uh, place home and how that um, is is impacting in our in our craft. Uh, well, I guess in my story, I try to approach it as a way that just to not subvert it but just assimilate the character into the culture to not make it uh like a traditionally newfoundland story but by virtue of these characters living in newfoundland and their life their like whole rich life of hiking and getting married and like wanting to have a family this all takes place in newfoundland these people aren't the typical narrative, and it doesn't look like a fisherman out for its story, but it's still a Newfoundland story by virtue of them being here and not that they're just come from a ways, but that they're just Newfoundlanders because they choose this place as home. So I tried to like assimilate has a negative connotation, but it's, I guess, integrate, like positively just mesh them together. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Zay, do you want to add something? Yeah. Okay. Um, Zuhao, do you, do you have something to say? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I know there's a perception of there's a strong dominant culture in Newfoundland and Labrador in particular. Um, but I mean, I, I personally have never felt particularly 
exclude it from that story because I'm just as capable as any other skipper at breaking lobsters with my bare hands and playing spoons. <laughs> but um, in appreciating that's how Newfoundland Labrador is perceived by the rest of the world, um, like I, I tried to highlight the hidden gems to add to the riches to the tapestry of our story. So, I mean, to your point, Santiago, like there's indigenous population here before colonization happened. And there's been documented immigrant presence in this province since the 1800s. And, you know, that's the future of this province as identified in the government's growth strategy. So I, I think there's always been spaces in between the that homogenous narrative, but they're filled by others. And, you know, however you want to define others, whether that's immigrants, refugees, uh, racialized community, LBGTQ plus members, or just people who don't necessarily identify with that stereotype. It's, it's just, um, it's time that we gave these stories more visibility so that there's a fuller representation of what it means and what, what it could mean to be a Newfoundlander Labradorian. But, you know, like, I mean, it's a, it, it's a responsibility, I think, for us to help bring that portion of our heritage uh, to, like, everyone else who might be wondering, what does it mean to be a Newfoundlander Labradorian? Thank you, Suhao. And, and say, uh, I think that um, I wonder if you have something to ask, uh, to add, sorry, about um, us uh, being part of the Newfoundland history, Newfoundland literature, in terms from our perspectives as immigrants and coming from, from different parts of the world. Uh, and how do we find that um, space in our in our craft? And I think you were talking about it. Hey, <laughs> you were talking about it uh, a little bit about you taking some time to think about the things that brought you here, right? So I wonder if there is anything that you would like to add about that. Yep. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I, uh, as you know, this microphone I'm doing to interview. Uh, I interview uh, and uh, last time I uh, got uh, Santi as well to house for the show, sitting with many immigrants, uh, newcomers, uh, refugees, and a lot of stories. A lot of things, uh, you know, if we even uh, uh, write more books, will be a lot of stories to tell from uh, newcomers, immigrants. And sometimes I cry because uh, some of them, uh, you know, from the, from a country has uh, spent years in refugee camps, no electricity and no water, and uh, some of them died because of uh, uh, expired uh, food, you know. So all kind of things make me like feeling uh, being here, being heard, uh, sitting with with uh, locals and indigenous tell me about the stories about this about that it's like uh and the big picture is not only about writings we sit down we understand each other's cultures and uh also this is new newfoundland and labrador so that's what uh, my, my my friend here this is at the face of newfoundland and labrador now so we are the face of that and uh, what we have to do is sit down and hear your let me hear your stories so that's what 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 make make uh, me feel that uh, i have to remind uh, uh, what i have to remember what my, what my background my my stories because a lot of stories to tell but if people don't ask don't know uh, don't want to sit down uh, uh, i don't know how to say it uh, sometimes uh, that's how we judge people because we don't sit down. We don't sit down, we don't ask. And uh, so to me, this, this uh, uh, being in, in the plan for uh, three years now, and I learn a lot how much, uh, how much Newfoundlanders and Labradorians want to know the newcomers, uh, new immigrants. Who is this people? Let's sit down and let's learn. Let's uh, what can uh, we do better? So, uh, uh, so far, uh, being an immigrant in open land is I'm feeling great. I'm fortunate that I decided to, from Indonesia 2017 to live in Canada, and I chose Newfoundland. So it's like a lot of things to learn. Not perfect, but a lot of things to learn. 
Mm -hmm, absolutely. And and you said something when you started talking about that, uh, say, uh, it really, I, I just like, I was just thinking, yeah, we need to make some time to listen, right? I, I think yeah. that there are so many stories, like we all, you know, we're only four people from the 11 from the book, um, that we all have different perspectives. And just because we are immigrants, our stories around immigration are completely different and our relationships to land and place and, and people are different. So if we take time to do that, to listen to each other, to li listen to the people around us, uh, listen to different communities, absolutely. I think the understanding of this world could be uh, way more uh, richer. Um, and then just thinking about this concept of island, like an island, and, and I mean, uh, it's it's so fascinating to me to hear you speak because the three of you come from actually um, from other islands and you find yourselves in, in, in an island. But for me, I am um, a Mexican uh, man uh, from Mexico City, Metepec, Mexico, which is not an island. But then I'm finding myself in one. So my relationship to city versus, you know, an island is completely different. Well, city versus the, because St. John's is a city as well. Uh, but anyway, you know what I'm saying. Um, so I, I think, um, well, the, the question that I have is what, what makes an island a different place? And what do they teach us about ourselves? Does anyone have anything like got reactions to that same? Okay, Zuha? I'll take that one. Um, so in, in my experience, like Islanders are very fiercely loyal to their families, communities, and there's that sense of resilience and independence often necessitated, I guess, by the physical separation, but it also encourages interdependence within the society itself. So I, I personally think being an Islander is a bit of commitment because you know that there's limitation to your ability to access places, um, other people like, and, and, you know, if you're still here or on any other island, I think it's a very personal comment on who you think you are and where you have found your sense of belonging. Yeah, absolutely. Saber, I see you giggling and I need to ask what is running through your, what is going through your head? <clears throat> I guess um, I do echo what Suha was saying. I, I thought about that ever since I, I like thought about this question. Um, specifically 13 or whenever I was in like 12th grade and looking at the brochure for Memorial to decide to come here. And it was like transportation to the mainland can be difficult. And that statement has just stuck with me forever. And it does, it does teach you a lot about like self-reliance, but also like you learn to get to know your fellow Islander because you all like need each other to like survive this new place, you know, find this place that people have been surviving on for thousands of years. So, but yeah, you need that sense of community, but it also pushes you to know that you are committing to something, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I I also had that similar experience with, I remember my dad when he was looking at the brochure and and like the, the travel aspect from Mexico to, you know, like to Canada and then to Canada to Newfoundland. And, and I'm just saying like, by Canada, I mean like really the mainland. And, you know, that there were two options, like either taking the ferry or, or fly. And my dad was so confused and he was like, where are you going, Santiago? I was like, to Newfoundland. <laughs> um, Zay, what are your thoughts about um, island? Like, what does an, an island teach us about ourselves? I think you're muted, Zay. There you go. Yeah, because I'm, uh, I like fishing. I like, <laughs> I like fishing, I mean, a lot. Newfoundland, I came from Benka Island. We had to eat fish almost every day. It's like we went to river, we have to catch fish and a uh, number of uh, Chinese descent uh, will with, with bicycle. Fish, fish. So, so we buy fish almost every day and we have to eat fish. 
Uh, so, and then came to Newfoundland. Uh, uh, Newfoundlanders uh, uh, introduced me, got jigging and trouting. It's like I'm from the island full of fish and coming to the island full of fish. <laughs> so what else? <laughs> what else I can, uh, uh, it's, it's like something like, uh, uh, oh my God, it's, it's uh, moving from an uh, island. This, this is like, uh, I'm feeling really connected to this land. It's it's because because they uh, the first uh, why, what I mentioned is people and second ones uh, nature and as well as fish. <laughs> That's, uh, why why people are important? Of course, uh, even though uh, there's a there there's a rich country in the world. If people are not really welcoming, it's hard to stay, right? So it's like uh, when you are coming from rich family. Even the rich family all can uh, be provided, but not nice family inside, you don't feel home. So Newfoundland, beside beautiful and also full of fish and people are number one. Uh, they make me like brother to them. So it's, it's something like, uh, same thing like in, in Bank Island, uh, moving from Bank Island, people are uh, uh, looking at me as, as, as a brother as well here. People look at me as as brothers. So moving from one uh, one uh, island to another island, only only different. Uh, this is four seasons. They're only uh, <laughs> only two seasons. That's it. Well, thank you, thank you so much for adding that, uh, Zay. Uh, and and I think there is something really fascinating, and we have been like talking about it, which is this relationship to to land. Uh, relationship to nature specifically and I think that there is something about something to say about like for instance uh, I that I live um, downtown St. John's Newfoundland and Labrador I you know I walk down the hill for five minutes and then I see the harbor right like it's just like it's out there and and I think that I when I need some inspiration or to clear my head I really have to get out right and 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 just like seeing that movement is, is really inspiring. So how does those nature and those elements, um, as specifically in, in, in relation to um, the island, uh, is, is influenced or, or, or perceived in your writing? How, how do you, you know, acknowledge that relationship with, with nature? Saber. Again, um, with the, in my story and like most of my writing and my life, like you mentioned, the ocean, I've like the ocean has been my thing since forever, and it's always been very calming for me. I, I maybe may, it probably does inspire me as well, obviously, but because I write about it. But you find my characters like going to go skip rocks or just like going to go walk and look at a harbor front or like doing something like Cuckold's Cove. I really love Cuckold's Cove and I mentioned that in like different stories. So nature nature is important and like that connection to nature kind of grounds my, my characters to home and to the place that they're living in, going and finding that if it is to like have a first kiss or to do something, there is a lot of, there's a lot of water, there's a lot of going into the trees or doing something, so. Yeah, it is that connection to home, that more of like a grounding feeling, kind of the concreteness as opposed to like, you know, an apartment or something. Yeah, yeah totally. Thank you, Xavier. Uh, Zuhao or Zay, any, any comments on that, Zuhao? Yeah, so um, to quote Tom Cal, thank God was surrounded by water. <laughs> um, so I, I've always been like myself, strangely drawn to bodies of water and they've kind of held a, mystical influence over my life. And maybe that's another Islander thing that I have. Um, so like a weird personal, like I, I almost drowned when I was six years old. And instead of being afraid, I actually felt this profound sense of safety, even though my hand was above the water waving like this, waiting for my grandfather to haul me out of the water. So I have a really complicated relationship with water. And um, so in, in, my, in this particular story included in us now, um, the family, literally traveled across oceans to find a new home. So they're separated by geographical waters, but they're always also separated by oceans of time, uh, change and growth. And I, I think this is something that 
a lot of Newfoundlanders, Labradorian families can empathize because uh, we do have a heritage of rotational workers who make that similar kind of sacrifice being away from your family. Uh, it, it's on a different scale, but you know, like a water and ocean is it's never too far from the daily life of the Newfoundlander. And you know, that's a function of weather uh, as a way of living, dying, and sometimes transformation. So to me, water and ocean is, um, is a cradle of life. And in my writing in, I, I let it appear as both a barrier, but it's also a charm, magical circle of protection. It's, it's an unknown that you have to brave, and that's a choice. Whereas in land is, is place, your place of grounding and rest. Um, when you touch water, that's what you become. And what that is, you, you won't know until you're in it, whether you sink or swim. And you know, land has that concrete you know, gravity that holds you to it. Whereas in water, there's buoyancy and you could be going anywhere. So I, I feel like that's reflected in my writing in that sense as well. And that's, again, that's a, that's more of a personal connection to water that I've always felt safe, even though you don't necessarily know where you're going in it, but that's where you go to change and grow. And, you know, you're, if you're, figuratively speaking anyways, if you're always on land, you're grounded, but you don't know what else you could be until you pass that unknown. Thank you, Suha. Zay, what about you? Uh, as I said, I like fishing. Fishing is, uh, out fishing is always about reflecting about a uh, trout is bonus. Uh, Sometimes we, uh, me and my partner didn't catch trout, but something uh, uh, when, when you go out, just around the pond, fishing, you create something, you talk to yourself and start to uh, write something. I remember the first time, uh, the first time I stand on the signal hill, I wrote a song uh, called The Lighthouse. Uh, I mentioned the signal hill and, uh, and also the lighthouse uh, uh, there. So uh, it's how much this land so, uh, connected to my heart and uh, they, they, when you take a deep breath even, uh, it's a really clear air, not like when I was in Jakarta for, for years, you know, in a big city with, uh, <laughs> with uh, uh, 15 million of people around, around that, uh, that crowd, you know, pollution and suddenly you are sitting in the very clear air in the world and it's like, you close your eyes, a lot of inspirations uh, uh, come to your head. Uh, so that's how uh, this land, uh, the truth is uh, bring a lot of, uh, give me a lot of space to think, to reflect. How to reflect that? Going fishing and as well as walking uh, on, um, what is that? It's sometime around the pond, you just take a walk. Just talk to yourself, be a friend to yourself, and start to write something. That's why I always bring my phone with me so I can write something. I can, uh, you know, record my own voice when I have some melodies in my head, and uh, uh, when, when I want to write a lyric, I just type it. So it's really, really um, in my in my writing is. This is uh, this is in my in my in my life. This is the the best pl uh, place to find inspiration, because small population and quiet, <laughs> mostly uh, somewhere. So uh, when you walk, so it's it's really really good. Thank you, Zay, and and I think that um, when it comes to my perspective, I also want to heighten that yes, there is very a uh, very strong relationship to nature in our writing as well, but there is also, you know, I, I think that that is like the, I don't want to say the stereotypical, but like the assumption of like, oh, island nature, but in particular in Newfoundland, um, we also get to see a very active nightlife, specifically here in, in St. John's. There is so much art. Um, we see it in, in our music industry, our theater industry, our literature. And so it's we have that luxury of, of having a strong connection to nature, but also all of the, the benefits of, of a, a thriving city. Um, 
Well, those are the questions that I have prepared for us, for the for the panelists today. Uh, I know that some folks are um, inputting some uh, questions uh, out on YouTube or on on the Zoom call. So please feel free. This is the moment uh, for you to to throw those questions to the panelists. Uh, before we go into there, I do want to say uh, I want to acknowledge the rest of the writers. Um, involved in us now. So um, uh, I, I want to acknowledge that the Quilted Collective uh, is conformed by Aisha, Saver, Prajula Dixit, Richard Alcock, uh, Zhu Haoshu, Kai Ku, Miwa, uh, Zainova, William Ping, Nabila Qureshi, and uh, Zobia uh, Shaheen Sheikh. And it was edited by Lisa Moore. And, and you can get our book um, on Breakwater Books and uh, stay tuned for our launch announcement. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, folks. Okay, so a couple of questions here. Thank you so much, Mandy, um, for sending these uh, away. So the first question says, um, your conversation made me think about islands and colonialism in the context of British literature. For example, islands are often places of the exotic or places to escape to. That's different, a different experience from folks who have real life experience in these places. Is there anything of you think folks expect to be true about your home islands or homeland that isn't true? What expectations surprise you? What would you like for people to know what is actually really similar between the island where you were born and Newfoundland? So a lot of questions here, which I love. So let's uh, break it down a little bit. Um, so um, this, this idea, like what are the things or the assumptions about our homelands, um, these islands that uh, you folks are, are from, that are just assumptions or stereotypes that are not entirely true. Any thoughts? Saber. I guess like with the Jamaica, the, the homogenized culture that people might expect, like, you know, what you see in the in the media from everybody, well, mostly, you know, like one type of like dance hall where they obsessed, I don't know, like weed is smoking with people um, or yeah, but I guess the varied layers of like a young queer person writing about his experience growing up in the city might not be as popularized as, that might be not the, the mainstream narrative that you hear about, yeah but it exists, obviously. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I, I, I understand. I think that there are some assumptions that are closer to the truth, right? Um, but also there are some, like what we see in the, in the news, right? Like the news, we only see like the bad things, the really like harsh things to watch. And, and we often forget to see the positive things. And, and that has happened to me like a little bit with Mexico. And I would say, oh, I'm from Mexico. They would always talk about like the narcos and drugs and, um, you know, violence. And I mean, yes, I'm going to be real. Those are things that happen in my country, but those are things that happen here too. So, um, you know, but, but because of the, the consumption of, of um, and the access to those stereotypes that are so out there, we often forget about the other side, right? Um, any other thoughts about like uh, stereotypes or, or assumption saver? Yes? I was just going to say the sounding like you don't sound like you're from here thing yeah yeah well and that's i don't know Zuhao, do you do you have something to say about that so um i i've, I've had that before um i, I do want to also jump in a little bit on the um i guess stereotypes about taiwan so a lot of people think think of a taiwanese in the picture of someone like me but so i i am a majority of the population that makes up Taiwan. So I speak Mandarin, I speak Taiwanese, I'm a Han Chinese by ethnicity. But there's also several um, different types of what you would call like in the Chinese ethnicity, there's subgroups that all live in Taiwan. We have a very robust um, 
and large indigenous population. And in the last 20 years or so, we've also welcomed a lot of immigrants. So there's um, a fairly large Southeast Asian population that lives in Taiwan as well. So in, in that way, Taiwan and Newfoundland are kind of similar that it, it's going through a transformational phase where it's, um, you know, uh, recognizing and repairing a relationship with this indigenous population, but also welcoming new immigrants to help make up a new generation of what it means to be Taiwanese versus Newfoundlander. So I, I really like the similarity between two places. And in my experience, I've actually, uh, through my work, I've met a few people that have had family members that, you know, we came here, my family came here and their family went over and stayed. So I have actually a client at work who told me that he's gonna be, once the vaccination and everything is done, he's gonna go visit his son and um, his son's Taiwanese wife and their now biracial grandchild in February. So I've heard these like, you know, exchange of stories before and that's fabulous to me. So. Right. Yeah, that is that is really, really great. Uh, Zuhal, thank you. Uh, Zay, there is a question specific for you. And it says, um, we heard that Zay also sings and does podcasts. How do these interact in any way or do they complement each other, your music and podcast? Share share with us a little bit about your your uh, journey as a as a musician and and a podcast creator, like, do they interact to each other? Do they talk to each other? How's that? We're curious. We want to know. Yes. Uh, uh, was that I, I, I work in Indonesia. I work in their, uh, my background was Islamic communication and broadcast. So I studied in the Islamic university, but I work at Christian radio for 10 years in that, in that uh, city to learn more about country music. Uh, so uh, I learned, uh, you know, I, I learned English as well from the music. So I can read many lyrics and pronounce word by word. So my apologies is my, if, uh, if something uh, you don't understand in my English because I learned from country music. <laughs> so uh, they, my music as well, uh, because radio is also about music. Right, uh, podcast is about stories, music, and also about the people. So uh, back to the, the, the uh, stereotype a little bit. Uh, you know, being in Indonesia, a number of uh, terrorist bomb in Indonesia coming to Canada was not that easy because uh, a lot of questions from uh, from the, the uh, embassy uh, about me. Even the, the first time I came uh, here in the, at the airport, a lot of questions because I came in the in the New Year, not a year, uh, in, in Christmas Eve. So that was a, a lot of question. Why do you come here in Christmas Eve and from majority Muslim population? But Indonesia is uh, around 17,000 islands. One bomb is not all Indonesia. One, uh, uh, one day earthquake, that's mean all Indonesia has earthquake because it's islands, it's seven, 17,000. So, so it's like zero, zero, zero point something. As my experience uh, to be a news anchor for 14 years in radio stations, 90% I read uh, to make money, <laughs> to make money. You know, our radio need to make money. Uh, uh, we have to tell bad news because that is the good news to make money. Uh, so uh, most of the things, uh, the news about Indonesia even I hear here in, 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 in Canada is about bad things. So. Uh, it's hard to explain to people if uh, people don't to come to Indonesia and visit island by island and see and talk to people and sit down on the beach, uh, a white sand beach and just uh, swim uh, uh, there in the ocean and talk to people and eat nice spicy food. So it's a lot of stereotypes uh, uh, coming because uh, even here in, in, um, in Northern Land, uh, when I said I'm from Indonesia, oh my God, Indonesia has a hard time lately. Yes, in that island, that's mean zero 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 point one percent of Indonesia, <laughs> you know. So, so uh, as well as my my podcast uh, and music, we, uh, we are doing the, here. Uh, we have many segments. Uh, we talk about immigrant stories. Why we we talk immigrant stories? Because. I don't understand Santiago. If Santiago doesn't doesn't want to tell his story and. This is how uh, oh, Santiago is from Mexico, be careful. But if I sit down with Santi, 
Zai, you are wrong about me. So that's how how I understand uh, people. This this podcast uh, since we start uh, 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 the podcast and we won uh, awards a couple of years ago uh, because we, we 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 sit down with many immigrants and they tell stories and how much new immigrants want people to hear us want to people uh, want people to understand who we are. So okay, this podcast sit down with us and talk about your uh, home country. And we want to know the music in your country as well, because the music is uh, very uh, related to you. Even so when, uh, when you are writing, you listen to, in, uh, like me, I uh, listen to Indonesian music. That uh, remind me uh, uh, how I grew up. So it's uh, this podcast and radio show is, is really uh, connect to each other because uh, 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 sometimes we talk about immigrants, successful immigrant stories. Uh, probably, if, uh, if we if we don't uh, go uh, get some uh, like Sant- Santi has a uh, production uh, theater productions, but Santi doesn't want to talk about that, <laughs> and we don't sit down to talk about that. People don't know, so that's uh, that's the how how much uh, this podcast is uh, as well a radio show at CHMR is is uh, really really uh, really connect to each other because we bring number of musicians as well to to perform to sing their songs yeah but because uh, big medias are already busy with their 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 contents right well, really busy with the content sometimes so we need alternative uh, uh, podcasts to accommodate a number of uh, immigrants so everybody come here and just tell us uh, what you have so let us hear you let us understand you. That this is how we 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 learn we build this uh, this uh, beautiful community. Thank you very much for saying that, Zay, and for the work that you do to make space for those conversations and to giving platform to immigrants like us to um, be heard. So thank you for that. And I am really sorry uh, to hear about your experience um, with um, with stereotypes and racism and Islamophobia. Um, when it comes to the danger of stereotypes and, and assumptions, right, and generalizations. Um, so sorry to hear that. Um, there is one last question that I do want to throw um, to the panelists just to wrap up. And, and I think I, I, there are so many questions and thank you so much folks, both in YouTube and on Zoom for um, throwing them great, great um, questions. But this one that I would like uh, to close the panel with is um, why do you write about what you write? So I'm gonna repeat the question again. Why do you write about what you write? And uh, I don't know if someone has any any thoughts on that. Zay? Uh, why do I write uh, what I'm writing, The Water Buffalo Boys? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, why? Why do you write about the themes that you write about? I I mentioned there's a there's a you know in the, the Sprite months, <laughs> the Sprite months, uh, you know, uh, LGBT is not only happened to human being but also our water our water buffalo. So so that that <laughs> this this was funny thing when we were kids. Uh, we uh, you know we didn't realize what uh, we we didn't know uh, our our gender at all at the time. We just only know well, that we have genitals. But uh, uh, that time, I remember that I'd had water buffaloes. Uh, uh, my parents was, uh, my, part, my father was expecting that I'd had when, the, when this uh, water, water buffalo grow up, we'll mate with, with our female because, because we want more, more <laughs> buffaloes, right? So didn't happen. And I'd have want to mate with that uh, male. So it's uh, this, uh, it's, uh, you know, why do I write these stories? It just to reflect how beautiful the memory was, my relationship with uh, my younger brother and our pet, <laughs> our pet water buffalo. So, uh, uh, so it's like, uh, why do I have to write this? Because it's beautiful. It's a beautiful uh, childhood that I can read over and over and make me cry, uh, make me cry because uh, there is a moment that in that in, in, in the story that I, I mentioned about my father had to and my brother and my mother had uh, lived 
uh, village for three years because my father had dialysis in Jakarta and I had to take care of my younger brother. It's like uh, as a nine, 10 years old boy had to, to, had to face the reality of this life and make me think, oh, this uh, is, I don't want to let this, this, uh, this story just disappear when, when I die. I need, uh, I need my family at least or people know uh, these this stories because this is beautiful uh, childhood memories of, of mine. So my family need to know this uh, because uh, my niece and my nephews need to read this. Oh, my uncle has this kind of uh, 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 crazy life when uh, he, was, uh, he was a kid. Uh, meanwhile, these days, kids already have the uh, economy is getting better there and people, uh, kids already play with their phones. This kind of childhood does not exist anymore uh, uh, there. So to me, it's good to uh, someday my, uh, my uh, nephews and my niece, uncle, please tell me your childhood stories. It's something like, okay, sit down, let me tell you the stories. It's like something to me is like, uh, I have to write this for, for no matter what. <laughs> and the second one, because uh, it's good as well as, a, as an immigrant and when English is not your first language, you have to improve your English by writing more and more. So this book is, uh, this book, uh, uh, this story and this book is very, uh, when I read all of this, they, they, uh, was that I learned word by word, uh, new words from everybody. So it's, uh, it's really meaningful for me. Thank you so much, Say. Uh, Saver, I, I saw that you were leaning in. Do you have anything to say about that? Uh, yeah, because, yeah, it's similar. They're beautiful memories and definitely parts of what make us who we are. So it's like, yeah, before I started writing, I, I never really thought about these memories, a lot of these memories a lot and, and fictionalizing them. So yeah, it's obviously important things and like, good memories and relationships that I care about deeply that I, and they're not, you know, like you said, they're not the norm for the either culture or like the place that we find ourselves in now. So to put my stamp in the world to be like, you know, different people that look like me were here at this time. Thank you, Zay. Uh, Suhao. Yeah, so I mean, to kind of piggyback on what Zai and Zaver have already said, it's it's putting, it is putting my stamp out on the world. It is a tribute to my heritage as a Taiwanese and as a Newfoundlander. And for me, when I write, there's always this sense I'm exploring on behalf of those who have come before me and those who will come after me. Um, like for a lot of my writings, like family, heritage, community is really important. I think that's what makes being human so exciting that there's always, in every turn, there's a chance for connection. There's something that you can leave behind for, to show others like, you know, in this moment in time, this is who we were. And, you know, you could you could guess like who we might become. And um, I, I always think that, you know, a, a, a people or a culture is not truly gone as long as you have stories told about them. So I wanted to make sure that I put this down in, in paper, whether that's for my children or, you know, for my generations down down the road, or just for other people who are interested in, in wondering, like, you know, what was it like to be this type of Newfoundlander in this environment, and what that could mean for the future. Thank you very much, Zuhao. And I think for me, I write what I write because that is my reality. I write uh, about brown, queer, immigrant characters in Newfoundland and Labrador because that is my perspective. And those are the stories that I want our community to, to see. Um, thank you so much to the ISISA 2021 conference for having us. Uh, it has been a pleasure. Thank you very much for tuning in. And I'm gonna pass it over to Mandy. Thank you, Santiago. And thank you so much, everyone. Uh, what a fantastic conversation. We've all enjoyed it so much. Unfortunately, it was recorded and we'll be able to share the link with everyone to rewatch and to share with friends. Uh, so that is all the time we have here today, but be sure to visit our conference website, www.mun.ca slash we are here slash isisa.php. It's a bit of a mouthful uh, for more information on our panelists today and links to their work. So get yourself a copy of Us Now from Breakwater's website, which I shared earlier in the chat. 
Uh, and thank you so much to the folks at Conference Events and Services for all their great support today and to Rebecca Coho at the Office of Public Engagement for organizing this panel. Thank you to our audience and most importantly, thank you to our panelists. We're so grateful you could be with us here today. And I'm sure we'll be hearing much more from you uh, in the future. Thanks guys. Thank you so much.